asking our research questions are really not about you know, the treatment eligibility, but we are asking many of these questions that I've listed here, can ART significantly reduce new HIV infections at population level using the test and treat strategy uh, you know, and combining other prevention approaches? And what are the secondary gains? Can we measure what impact we have on maternal and child transmission, on TB, on education, on household earning power? You know, we want to measure all of those things to understand what gain we get when we treat uh, many people, when we put everybody on, on, on treatment. And then what is the best way to do it? I mean, it is very easy to say, you know, treat all of these people, but how to deliver that intervention is, is part of the question that we want to answer. And what would it cost? Um, can we find persons with HIV and link them to care? It, it's quite, quite a challenge to find everyone. There are people who are what we call the low-hanging fruits. In fact, we get people who come for testing every other day, you know, but the people whom you want to test and treat do not come. So can we find them and link them to care? Do high CD4 patients want therapy anyway? Do they want it or they don't? And then um, how do high CD4 patients do on therapy? And does population HIV RNA go down after increased ART? So these are some of the questions we really want to answer, which are beyond guidelines. Now I want to share with you, since I'm not going to share a lot about the data we have in the main trial. Uh, in fact, we are meeting next week. You know, we have a retreat to, to actually go through the data and begin generating data that we can share in meetings. So I'll share with you some of the data we've generated in the pilot part of our studies. Now this is what we call the early study, early antiretroviral therapy in resource limited settings. We looked at patients who are more than 350 T cells. So those are the ones we called high CD4 at that time. You remember we hadn't moved to 500. And then we looked at whether they adhere to treatment retention. I think as you can see there, adherence is very high, retention is very high, virus suppression is 96%, too good to believe, but, but that's what we found. Then we also found that medical officer usage, you know, we did what we call streamlined care, because these people were, most of them were asymptomatic. They didn't need a doctor anyway. So we, we, did, we decreased the medical officer usage um, so that these people can be treated by lower level people, such as nurses. And then we also piloted rapid transit through the clinic, you know, get them seen quickly and, and they get out. So we, we demonstrated that all of this is, is possible. Um, and then we also looked at, do high CD4 patients desire therapy in the first place? And as you can see there, we, we found that actually they do. And most of them really want therapy because they want to keep healthy. They want to keep working. And, uh, and, and you can see the rest of the reasons there. But actually 90% said they want therapy because they want to be healthy. Now we've also, in one of our studies, we looked at, you know, we did community health campaigns in a defined area. So we did one in 2011, then repeated it in 2012. So we identified, you know, everybody who was HIV positive, perhaps not everybody, but most people who are HIV positive, and linked them to care during the 2011 community health campaign. And of course, we measured, you know, viral loads. And then we repeated the campaign in 2012 and, and measured and compared viral loads in 2011 before we sent many people to treatment uh, compared to 2012. And then as you can see there, you know, and the undetectable viral load increased from 37 to 55. In other words, the people who had undetectable viral load increased. And you can read, I guess, the rest of the metrics there. Um, but, but what we saw was you can decrease population viral load uh, in this community, you know, by testing people uh, using these campaigns. Then, so let me turn to our search study, which is the main trial that we are doing. 
Um, many of you have probably seen this slide. We are doing a study in both Kenya and Uganda. We are having 32 communities. Each community is 10,000 people. So overall, we are having 320,000 people in our cohort. Um, and we've enrolled all of them, you know. We did census and, and whatever, and, 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 and uh, did the fingerprinting of everyone so we know everybody in the community. And right now, you know, we do these annual community health campaigns um, every year, and then the, the outcomes is, uh, the main outcome is HIV incidence, but as I said, there are many uh, secondary outcomes, including workforce, child labor, and all of those that are listed there. So that is the general design of our, of our trial. And uh, the primary outcome, as I said, is five-year HIV incidence among adults more than 15. But you can see that we are measuring a lot of other secondary endpoints, including non-communicable diseases. Um, so this is how we do the campaign. We don't limit it to just testing for HIV. I think many of you have heard when we've presented in meetings, we actually make it a comprehensive disease screening uh, strategy. So we screen for HIV, diabetes, hypertension, we do TB screening, and then and malaria screening and treating people for malaria. So in other words, we optimize these community health campaigns so that, you know, all diseases. And this is how we are going to leverage, you know, uh, HIV infrastructure, you know, to cater for other, other diseases. So this is really an opportunity, in my opinion, where you, you do this leveraging. Now, somebody may ask, what is our such intervention strategy? I've listed here, it's not really one intervention. Um, it's, it's a combination of, can we find people and test them through these community health campaigns. And we do the campaigns, but also supplement it with home testing. So in other words, we are able to get, I mean, if you don't come to the campaigns, we come for you in the home. Remember, you know, we have, we have uh, fingerprints of all of these people, so we are able to know who has not. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, for, we also do key populations. We do much more testing for those and linkage to care. We are also doing immediate ART at all CD4 counts and rapid ART start. I mean, we, we treat people within a short period of time. Uh, we do enhanced linkage and retention. We do chronic disease model, including uh, HIV care. We do what we call patient-centered treatment, which is uh, efficient. We do um, HIV RNA viral load counseling, where we get a viral load and counsel people about adherence. So in other words, uh, it's, it's maybe, even if I don't mention everything, but you can see it's a package. The intervention is a package rather than, rather than just a single intervention. Um, so are the guideline changes going to affect us? You know, our argument is that such does not aim to evaluate the impact of change in CD4 eligibility criteria, but rather we aim to evaluate the impact of population-based cascade-wide transformation of HIV testing and care delivery system. So we, our aim is a, little, is a little different. In other words, we shall supply a lot of uh, information about how to get to the 90, 90, 90, how to roll out, uh, you know, these ambitious 90, 90, 90 targets. Uh, so our study design, including the sample size calculations, were planned, um, you know, we planned them in anticipation for the expanded ART eligibility. Um, I think, let me go, I'm, I'm, I think I'm about to finish. Uh, we all know that the problem, the problem with with uh, HIV is re really this cascade. If we were able to optimize this cascade, we would be doing a very good job. Now, I've already mentioned some of the opportunities that we are taking advantage of in our such trial, such as leveraging uh, HIV infrastructure for non-communicable diseases. We've successfully done this and published some papers, actually. 
you know, trying to look at hypertension and uh, how much of that we identify and linking hypertension to, oh, very good, actually three minutes are enough. Uh, you know, linking, <laughs> linking them to care. So we are able to take opportunity of our HIV uh, to, to, for, for non-communicable disease. We are able, you know, to look to, to identify this, to test these key populations. We actually do what we call venue-based testing for high-risk populations. I mean, if you are the fishing landing sites, we we'll go there. The border borders, we've got some way of, of, of getting those. So in other words, we are going to provide information. How do you identify and, and, and test these high-risk uh, populations? Um, there are many challenges of this treatment as prevention trials. I don't think I can even exhaust them. Male participation is one of our biggest challenges, uh, just like we, we've been discussing in this meeting. In fact, we are using a lot of qualitative feedback to improve our outreach to males. Stigma is, uh, sometimes we think it is going down, but it is still there when you begin to you know, reach 100% testing. There are people who have stigma. And, and some of the solutions is perhaps integrating HIV care into general care, looking for mobile populations, managing community expectations, and, and a number of challenges that, that we face. You know, um, I, I like this, you know, to show how some of the people doing our work, how they go out into the villages. You can see when it rained somewhere in Western Uganda, for those of you who come from Uganda, and how those young men uh, are doing. Lastly, but not least, I would like to thank Makere University UCSF Research Collaboration and the organizers of this meeting, but most especially to Remember my, my friend, I know he was a friend of all of you, but you Plang was a friend of mine. Um, do I have half a minute? Half a minute. Uh, you know, um, a few, a couple of months before Yup died, uh, I met him in, in an airport lounge. You know, just like you're sitting around, I was seated in one corner and was seated somewhere. When he spotted me, of course he was sitting with, you know, many people and, and uh, let me just dare say this, they were all white he was sitting with. So he saw me somewhere, and some of these American airports, you know, you may be the only black in the lounge. <laughs> <laughs> so he spotted me, and he came out and said, Moses, come on, come and join us. And then he said, do you want some wine? And actually, he went to the counter, brought some wine for me, uh, I don't take a lot of it, but I took some of it. <laughs> and, and, uh, and really, Yup was a good man. Apart from being a scientist and an activist, I think he had another side to him that I saw during that time. So rest in peace, Yup Lang. Thank you.